Um, all right, so now you have not been diagnosed for that long. Um, and so I'm, I always love to hear kind of new diagnosis stories um, because I just find you're in such this like, it's just so mind blowing, right? And it's like everything in your life radically changes for some of us. I mean, I guess there are people who are just sort of shrug and they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But you know, for me, and I think for many women who are diagnosed in adulthood, it is just like so radically life-changing. And I found one of the reasons why I reached out to you and really wanted to interview you was because like, I talk a lot on this podcast about new motherhood and new and baby, the baby years. Right. And it was so profound looking back and thinking about all of these struggles that I had as a new parent and how they related to ADHD. So I want to get into that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, first I want to, I want to hear about your diagnosis. When were you diagnosed and kind of what was happening in your life that led up to you thinking I should really, I should really look into this. Oh man, I could talk <laughs> for like two hours just based on just that question alone. Um, but the, the thing that really like prompted me to get diagnosed was like a very small moment where I was scrolling Facebook. And a friend of mine who I really respect and adore, she's um, she's actually a, like a international board certified lactation um, consultant too. So, and we just connect on so many things. And she posted this like, you know, meme or whatever. And it was like, um, all the things, it, I'm gonna butcher this, but it was something like, you know, all the things that, you know, affect you when you have inattentive ADHD. And it had like uh, this pie chart and it had a million things listed. And then at the end it was like, and if you have ADHD, like inattentive ADHD, you didn't read any of that. Uh. And I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't read any of that. <laughs> and I was like, I couldn't even focus on it. And um, that was when I was like, okay, I think I really do have ADHD, but I had been looking at it for a long time um, and I've done so much inner work and trauma work and, you know, like wrestling with um, anxiety and depression and all of these pieces and really unpacking my childhood and generational trauma and you know, all the things. And yet, when I would sit down to write a blog post for my business, I could not focus. I couldn't focus. I couldn't r write an email. Like I couldn't, I could not get my thoughts together. And that was, it was like, I did all this work to get to this point where I was finally free to, you know, chase my dreams, right? Like to live them out. And yet I felt like these most basic things that had been plaguing me my whole life, not being able to just sit down and write something, even though I have it all in my head, I couldn't focus. And when I kind of clicked and realized wow, like this could be ADHD. Like it could maybe not be my fault. Like maybe I'm not broken. Like maybe I'm just a little bit different and this is just normal. And there's actually things out there that could support me. And that's really what um, kind of prompted me to reach out and get the diagnosis. So did that answer your question? I, <laughs> ADHD, I can't even like hold the question in my head. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I'm curious cause your kids are still pretty young, right? How old are your yeah. kids? four and two four yeah so like I always feel I always say this on the podcast too I'm like whenever I meet a mom with ADHD with kids that young I'm like I just want to give you a hug because like, <laughs> those years were so difficult and I feel like I'm out of that time period now with my kids but like weren't you just sort of like oh I'm just a new mom I need more sleep or you know like I feel like there's so many ways yeah. when our kids are young that we minimize what's happening and think like everything will be fine once I get a good night's sleep everything will be fine once my kids are in school you know like there's all these ways in which we dismiss this that struggle totally I completely understand and for me the the struggles had been there for so long well before kids that that's when it was really like like something you know and and for me yes I had all these struggles with with like sleeping and you know kids needing me but I've done so much work that I feel more empowered in that. Like, and you know, even with the, like the lack of sleep and whatnot, like um, that, that didn't really seem to be the things that made me want to dismiss it. It was more like before it was like, well, I've got this trauma. Well, I've got this anxiety. Well, I've got, but I had all of that kind of like under control. So there was still 
something that was missing. And yes, my life with young kids is is a bit um, bonkers and bananas. I mean, even as you said that, they were like banging on the door. <laughs> like it's like you know, it just it, it's it's life. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. For me too, it was really having kids that um, prompted me to to look inward and to consider, you know, like, okay, what, who am I? What are my values? Like, do I really want to just like carry on the things that I was kind of like handed? Like it really it, it empowered me to um, start questioning kind of the world around me and, and why things were the way that they were and kind of own that. And in doing that, I um, I learned so much about conscious parenting and positive parenting and gentle parenting. Um, I studied psychology in university. I loved child development. I loved all those things. So um, I think that in so many ways, I like becoming a mom, like in, actually empowered me to to really grow up and to really be, and I don't use the word grow up as if I was like immature before, but just emotionally and in myself and have that confidence. So I felt like a whole new person in a, in a beautiful, wonderful way at becoming a mom. And yet there was this piece that I felt like I was hiding like this, uh, you know, we talk about kind of, and I've heard you talk about like that. It feels childish, like the ADHD symptoms. It feels like immature. It feels like, why am I struggling with these things? I feel young in these areas. Like I can't write a paper, you know, like I can't do these things. And so it was really um, kind of confusing and, and difficult. Um, and so having the diagnosis was just such a, a relief and validation and um, really freed me up to be like, okay, now I can work with that okay mm. now now that i understand this like it's not just me being broken right yeah oh my goodness there's i i feel like a lot of my own grief about looking over through my life and how how my life could have been different had i just known um and like you say like that's i think that's what really really brings the an adhd diagnosis home like you know it's one thing to see a video and be like oh i relate to that i, I can't focus right now and then when you st you know and then from there you start really looking into what adhd is and the many ways in which it impacts you over the course of your life and it's just like yeah you're just looking through years and years of seemingly random struggles and trauma you be like oh my goodness i can't believe these all come back to this one solution um and i think for me like the the early baby years are the one time in my life where I really wish I could like go back and get a redo because it's, it is, it's such a precious special time in your life. And like, I really envied moms who felt like they could just kind of ride the waves, you know, like for me, I felt like I did so much research when I was pregnant with my first kid. Cause it's like, I was terrified. Like you said, I didn't feel like a grown up. I, I, you know, when you were saying that, I distinctly remember my husband and I coming home from the hospital to our apartment, um, in New York with our first baby and like having that moment of panic. Like, I can't believe they let us leave the hospital. I can't believe we're alone <laughs> in our apartment with this baby. Like, what are we going to yeah. do now? Uh, but it was that same sense of like doing so much research, wanting so badly to um, be prepared and to, you know, to figure out how, like, what am I, you know, I just, I just want to do this right. And then getting hit with the chaos of, of babies and feeling like so much of that, you know, so much of the, it's a struggle for anybody. I, you know, it's always going to be a struggle for everybody. You're, you're not sleeping. I mean, there's so, it's just so many crazy factors. Like you said, it's bonkers. Um, but I think the difference for, for us with, for those of us with ADHD or undiagnosed ADHD is that we tend to like think what's wrong with me. I am the problem. Right. And that's, yes. I want to go and give that woman a hug and be like, look, you know, yes. you're tired and you are really, really, you have a lot of sensory issues that you don't realize. <laughs> and, yep. you know, um, yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, backtracking a little bit when you're, what are some of the things since your diagnosis in your past that you've gone back and looked at and said, Oh, the signs were there all along. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. What couldn't I say? Um, I think that the biggest one for me that really like, just, I don't know. It just like went right into my heart. Just like, Oh, that was that, <laughs> um, was actually was when I was listening to the, um, the radical 
guide for women mm-hmm. with ADHD. Is that the name of the book? I can't, radical, I can't even remember the name of the book. A radical guide for women with ADHD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I forget which one of them was talking about, like which of the authors was talking about their experience with like not knowing what they wanted to kind of do with their life and like having like, you know, these kind of like this meandering path to kind of get somewhere. And, and she was lucky enough to have like some therapy in like high school and whatnot to kind of like support her her on that journey. I didn't. When I was in high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do, quote, with my life. And I had so much potential. I was so, you know, like, and I loved all of these things. And I was so excited. I I did theater and singing and I loved science and I had all of this stuff. And I was terrified, terrified of the future. I also had this like feeling that I was going to be like washed up at 19. Like, it was like, this is like, I, if I don't, if I don't do all the things and I'm not perfect and I'm not, you know, like, I'm just, I'm, I'm done. Like I have no worth and no value. Like it just, it's, it felt like just this weight of pressure. Um, and I, I applied to university and then I didn't go and I ended up interning at this church for a couple years. And then I, and then I applied again and then I couldn't pick a major and I kept changing my major like over and over and over again. And then I couldn't write a paper. I so struggled to write a stinking paper. And I ended up um, taking this class twice and not writing a paper both times. I was just so overwhelmed. And I also felt like I couldn't reach out for help because like I was too good for that. There was this like, you know, this like thing because like, because I really, it wasn't that I didn't understand the material. It was like looking back, it was like literally executive functioning. Like I literally couldn't like, I just, couldn't pace myself and and chunk it down into small steps and work my way through it and the weight of that was just so heavy um in my that was my third year and I was taking psychology and um like I kind of got like dropped out of my program like it wasn't like I failed out of university um I, I had good grades it was the classes that required papers I would just like not hand in a paper and so I'd scrape by with like you know a, a 50 or a 60 and I'd like get the credit and then I couldn't with this one course so I stopped going to school because man I didn't even know what I wanted to do it felt like so much money and so much time and I just had this like weight of like guilt and shame about not knowing what I wanted to do it seemed like everybody else had it so figured out and I was like who the bleep am I like what do I want what can I like I don't know and and, like understanding now that like people with ADHD just like have a lot of passions (laughs) right they have a hard time picking things I want to do all the things yeah I totally related to that like everything feels exciting and urgent yeah yeah and it was like just like now looking back at it it's like well that was exciting wow I had a lot of things going on and then it was crippling the anxiety was just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have this figured out. I can't tell anyone about the struggle because I have to be perfect and I have to look like I have it all together. And, you know, it just like the weight was crushing at that point. Um, thank God I reached out and got some therapy and some help at that point. But um, yeah, so looking back, that was like, that was just the thing. I was like, oh my God, that was ADHD. That's what it was. And it's a, like, it's a kind of a beautiful gift now. Like, wow. Um, yeah, so that was like a huge thing for me looking back. Yeah, it's been fascinating with the book club, like exploring um, how difficult it is to ask for help. Like that's whole a whole other oh, episode. <laughs> <laughs> but I really related to what you were saying about like, I should, you know, I think a lot of us relate to that idea of like, I can't ask for help because I am, I'm too good for help. You know, like there's a way that we're sort of like, asking for help is akin to weakness and we are like we've spent so much time trying to prove our worth in that way you know in in so many ways that i think asking for help feels doubly difficult yeah uh, in so many situations especially the school yeah i dropped out of university after my first year too because i was like i don't know what i'm doing it's such a waste of money <laughs> I Eventually, wish I would have dropped out after my first year. Uh, yeah. Where did you go? <laughs> I'm still paying off. I went to the University of Windsor. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I went to McMaster. And, uh, and yeah. yeah, it was, uh, it was, the only reason I went back was because my grades were so terrible. I couldn't go anywhere else. They were the only people <laughs> who would take me back. <laughs> um, I love it. And, but, you know, it ended up being okay. I mean, I ended up yeah. getting, you know, pulling my 
pulling myself together and getting and being able to graduate. But it's like, I feel like I've talked about this in other episodes, that feeling of like, I had to drop everything in my life and just focus on my yep. grades. And, you know, how much we have to like, how much we have to like pull the strength to just do one thing because of that sense of like, I want to do all the things. I want to do everything. I'm being pulled in a million different oh, yeah. directions at all times. Um, okay. So now let's fast forward to, um, new motherhood and with, you know, I'm assuming it was your own experiencing experience with parenting and new motherhood and breastfeeding that led you to become a parenting coach and a lactation coach. So what, what kind of inspired you in that, in that phase? Yeah, absolutely. So, so many things. Um, it was really so with my daughter, with breastfeeding, um, I took a breastfeeding class before, like prenatally. So I'd taken like a prenatal class, like about like labor and delivery and like all that kind of stuff. And then separately, I took a breastfeeding class and my mind was blown. I mean, I was breastfed. My mom breastfed me till I was like two. So like, it, I thought that it was just like normal and natural. I didn't even really want to go to this class, but my mom is actually a doula. Um, like a labor and delivery doula and she was I was like well you could take this class to like you know for extra for the you know continuing credits that you need and yada yada and I was like I'll go with you and I was just like whoa so then I you know fast forward a couple months and I'm in the hospital and I give birth to my daughter and um, we really struggled with breastfeeding she she latched once in the time we were at the hospital but other than that I was hand expressing and syringe feeding and she was really sleepy. She she wouldn't wake up to feed. Um, they kind of called her like a lazy latcher, <laughs> you know. Um, but because I had this prior knowledge, because I had taken this class, I really felt pretty empowered. And I was kind of like, okay, like, okay, this is what's happening. But like, I got this, you know. And I had the right people to reach out to. Like, I had already made these connections with this lactation consultant. So I was like, okay, like, I'm going to call her. And I had all these kind of connections. So it was hard. Do not do not get me wrong. There was like lots of times where I was freaking out and you know in the middle of the night hand expressing and syringe feeding and holding her and my daughter she doesn't have an ADHD diagnosis she's four um but she absolutely had sensory things happening from birth like she didn't like to be like stroked or touched she would bristle at that she was really colicky um she ended up having like a tongue and lip tie so we had those revised like a laser revision with a uh, local dentist who does that um anyway so we had all of these things going on but I had this sense of like stability through it because I I had these supports and then I watched my friends giving birth at the same time around me and they didn't have those supports like I was the one going there as a brand new mom having taken like you know four hours of a prenatal breastfeeding class not not geared to be, become any kind of expert but just like you know a mom doing it and I was the one like holding their babies with them and showing them how to hand express and, you know, helping them and, and getting them the right contacts. And I just, so I just realized like, first of all, I love this, like, wow, this is so exciting. And second of all, oh my gosh, there's such a need here. Like, wow, the difference that just having the right support and information made for me was like night and day, even though I had lots of struggles, um, I had this, you know, like ability to kind of like, you know, hold, like, I don't know, be held through the process, if that makes sense, like emotionally, like this confidence that like, okay, like, no matter what happens, like, we're going to be all right. And I have the information I need. And I know that the choices that I'm going to make um, are the best choices for me and my family, because I, I felt empowered that way. Whereas I saw my friends who were just terrified. And, you know, like my friend, she was gave birth at the same hospital just a couple months later, had the exact same issues. And she was sent home with formula. And nothing wrong with formula but that's not what she wanted and I did I wasn't we had the same issues and I wasn't sent home with formula and we we were able to you know keep going towards our goals and she wasn't so it was like what's happening here and the difference was really support you know so that's yeah that kind of led me towards that yeah yeah I definitely fell into the no support um terrified category <laughs> with my first yeah. where I was like I had a similar issue where I actually took a prenatal course you know um and there was a breastfeeding section of the course but it I didn't feel like I learned much like I just sort of felt like it's right. one of those things where you really don't know what you're doing like there's only 
you can hold a doll up to your boob, but like they really once it's not until you're actually in the moment Absolutely. that it, you kind of start to understand. And you know, you you can't like simulate letdown or anything like that. But like so and and so when we I was in the hospital with her, you know, she wasn't latching and I was having a lot of difficulty and felt so much pressure from the nurses who would just be like, Come on, come on, you gotta latch now. If she's not gonna latch now, we're gonna feed her formula. And I just felt like I was like on that clock, whereas if I couldn't figure it out in the hospital, they were gonna and I think they actually did take her and bottle feed her. And then I was like, Oh no, if she bottle feeds, she's gonna get lazy. She's not like it just felt like from the get go. There was always that feeling like, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. And, and then at the same time, like going home and I actually did hire a lactation coach who came and visited me in my home and she was amazing and she was great. And so, you know, but it was not cheap. Uh, (laughs) And, um, uh, and then I just always felt like I used to always say, like, I wish there were ounce markers on my boobs, right? Because right. that was the thing that always bothered me about breastfeeding was like, every time your child is crying, they some the person who is holding the baby, if it's not you, gives them back to you and says, I think they're hungry. And, you know, and I was always frustrated because I was like, I don't know, I just fed her and I really need to take a shower <laughs> or, you yeah. know, like all of those moments, I hear where, you. right? Where I was like, oh, well, maybe I'm not giving her enough and maybe she's not getting enough. So maybe we should supplement with it. Like it just, it was just that yeah. overwhelm of always feeling like maybe, maybe I don't know. Like, you know, I really felt like motherhood was going to really be a lot more intuitive <laughs> and, right. and so it wasn't have, for me. Uh, Right. Yeah, I, I know. have so many thoughts about this. Oh my goodness. I could talk about this forever. Right. But That's why I'm like, I want to give that things. poor woman a hug. Right. First of all, and I know that you relate to this so much, but like, I think that diet culture really does a number on our brains before we even get to motherhood. And so we can be very obsessed with like, um, with the type of food that our baby's getting. Is it the right food? Is it the wrong food? You know, oh, like yeah. we can have this. Are kind they of, like, eating? Are they not? Are they eating too much? Are they exactly. not eating enough? Yeah. And I think we're just really primed to like have that kind of perspective, like moving into it. So we can be really obsessed and focused on that. um, And it makes so much sense. So much sense. Um, Two, that what a lot of times the prenatal education that we get when it comes to breastfeeding is very much just focused on here's the positions like this. You latch like this. You take the nipple and you do this. And I mean, depending on what era you you were like taught how to breastfeed in you either were taught like the ram method which is like the rapid arm movement they just want you to like like literally like (laughs) toss the baby on your breast right or then it's like okay well you have to do it like this and it has to look perfectly like this and and you'll have nurses in the hospital that look and like well the latch looks perfect meanwhile mom is like literally like clenching her toes and her fingers every time the baby latches because it's so painful so really like what we want to look at with what what is a good latch a good latch is a latch that's comfortable and that is functional. So we want we want it to feel comfortable and be functional. So it's got to be comfortable for mom. If it's not, that's not a good latch. Functional means that the baby's actually getting milk, you know? And I think that when we look at um, breastfeeding, so in my local area, in Windsor, Essex, um, Ontario, we have the lowest breastfeeding rates in Ontario. So about um, 80% of women go into the hospital intending to breastfeed, 50% leave breastfeeding. By two months, 25% of breastfeeding. And by six months, 16% are breastfeeding. And those numbers are actually a few years back. So with the pandemic, I imagine that it's just tanked a lot more. Um, And that's literally some of the lowest breastfeeding rates in the world we have Mm -hmm. locally. It's certainly the lowest breastfeeding rates in Ontario and it's it's, it's some of the lowest breastfeeding rates in the world. So what happens with this is that, I mean, 80% of the women are going in intending to breastfeed. So it's not a lack of like desire (laughs) that's happening, but we have this mindset like breastfeeding is absolutely like it's just a biological norm like for the overwhelming majority of people like your breasts are going to produce milk whether your baby breastfeeds or not and your baby's going to like be rooting for a nipple whether whether they're being breastfed or not so it's just you know it's just the norm but culturally the norm is formula feeding is, is bottle feeding and formula feeding so if we were in a world that culturally breastfeeding was the norm, you wouldn't even think of how many ounces your baby is getting breast milk. Well, like I the think, thought wouldn't even like occur to you. <laughs> I think right? culturally there's also the norm is to get back, get your body back, get back to work, oh, yeah. get back. Like, I think it has Plus. much more to do with the pressure on women to have like the, you know, structure that doesn't 
allow for breastfeeding too. I think that's, you know, our totally. lives are structured in a way that it makes it incredibly yeah. difficult for women to breastfeed. And I think that's like a reciprocal thing where like the more you formula feed, like the more the culture formula feeds, the more that those expectations can be made, yeah. the more you need to, right? And I I do not, I fully believe that breastfeeding versus formula is a false dichotomy. Those are not two choices. Every baby comes out ready to breastfeed in that sense. Like, you know, and of course there's complications. Just like not, you know, like some babies, whatever. We always have these delays and these, these issues. Um, just like some women do have like glandular tissue um, issues where they just don't have enough glands to make breast milk of course of course these things happen and there's like a full spectrum of alternatives that we can offer tons of alternatives most women don't realize that they could syringe feed they can you can formula feed at your breast with a like a small tube that comes down to your breast so you can actually breast feed like give formula at your breast if you wanted to there's so many options available but we kind of have this like instead of supporting parents with information we we just kind of like offer these two options but there's risks and drawbacks that come with every alternative, right? Like, and so understanding those means that you can then, you know, have accommodations to mitigate those risks. Okay, like a risk of formula feeding, much higher rates of SIDS. Okay, well, if we look at that and understand why that is, it's often because formula um, is not as easily digested in the infant's body. So they tend to sleep harder, like deeper. And when their bodies are not being like regulated, um, as well like they can easily become dysregulated it's easy for their little systems to not like become alert again and so they can literally not wake up so how can we mitigate that well we can room share we can put the baby in our room so that they are like in close to us by beside the bed so that they're hearing our movements and our sounds and we're hearing theirs so we can actually re respond to them quicker but when you when you just think well formula feeding is just the norm then you're like okay you then it's so easy to put a formula fed baby in another room because like it's not you know like the your boobs aren't like bursting with milk that you feel like you need to go and grab the baby mm -hmm. um so yeah i don't know if that but we can just kind of create this like snowball effect where and and because of that then the more women that want to breastfeed like there's just not the supports available because it's so normal to just not so it's like well just don't right but the reality is is that that's like, I consider that trauma for so many because they want to breastfeed and their very first whack at parenting. It's like, you're not good enough. Yeah. You don't know exactly. what you're doing. You know? Oh man. I know. I know. Is there so, <laughs> and even with the, even with room sharing too, like I remember really struggling with room with co-sleeping because my husband was always worried about co-sleeping. He was always terrified mm -hmm. of co-sleeping and also he was back at work. So like I wanted him to get a good night's sleep because yeah. it was like, he needed to be able to function. And so like, there was just, yeah, there's always just like 10 factors that were just weighing down every I decision. I ended up, I ended up um, weaning my daughter at three months because I had gone back to work because I had to go back to work at 12 yeah. weeks, which is a whole, another whole episode, um, which I'm, I'm surprised that the breastfeeding rates are so low in Ontario. Cause I, you know, since I had both of my kids in the U S I always was like, so embarrassed yeah. because all of my friends from back home in Ontario were having 12 month, you know, parental leaves from their jobs. And I was like, eh, I get 12 weeks, maybe if I can save up for it. Like I just, it was so yeah. anger inducing. Um, so I would have thought having a longer, you know, more generous parental leave would encourage uh, breastfeeding rates. So that kind of surprised me. So I ended up weaning my daughter because at three months, because I went back to work, I worked in a newsroom. So there was no offices. It was just like a big newsroom Ugh, of desks. Yeah. And so my boss was like, okay, you have two options for pumping. Um, you know, this was, they didn't have any kind of like, you know, pumping rooms or anything that some, you know, more cushy companies have. But so they were like, your two options are you can ask the editor in chief to vacate his office every time you want to pump on deadline. So like that wasn't going to happen. Or you can go into the wheelchair bathroom, which was the one bathroom that was like not, you know, it wasn't the stalls. So it was like this right. one isolated lockable room, which is where everybody went to take a shit. So it was like, those were my two <laughs> options uh, in terms of, oh. in terms of pumping. So I very quickly, like, was like, you know what, it's just going to be easier for everybody involved if I wean. And I had a much better experience with my son because, you know, I, my, my experience with new motherhood was so difficult. Going back to work for me was 
was like you said, it was traumatic. It was so awful. I had this job that I loved and suddenly I was a terrible parent who had, cause I was going back to work full time and had a full time nanny. Mm-hmm. And then I was also mm-hmm. terrible at my job. And it just was like, I just felt like I wasn't good at anything. It was really hard. So like when we decided oh. to have a second child, you know, we decided to leave New York city and move out into the, to the Hudson Valley so that we could, we could, so I didn't have to work. Like, I just was like, I, there's no work-life balance for me. Uh, I had to, I I was like, if we're going to do this again and have another baby, I have to be at home. I have to be a full-time stay-at-home mom. And so we moved and I had a much easier time with breastfeeding the second time around because, you know, literally just was at home sitting on the couch most of the days with my son. So it was, uh, it was great. But then, um, there was a lot of pressure. I had pressure on myself to wean because I wanted to go back on antidepressants because I felt like such, you know, the PPD, which now again, through the lens of ADHD, I want, I was like, it was not postpartum depression. I, you know, it was ADHD. And that's another thing that I'm just yeah. like, I want to give new moms a hug. And I like, I really wish they could connect the dots a lot of the time. Cause it's just yeah. felt like, and also, yeah, the, so my emotional doctors... regulation was so disrupted right. because of the sleep deprivation and the rage. Like I just would get thrown into a rage a lot of the time. And often I would be aimed at my husband or my four-year-old. And so it was like my, I remember my husband being like, I know you really want to breastfeed as long as possible. I know this is important to you. I know that your first child experience was I, not ideal, but you also have me and your other child to think about, you know, like it would just, I right. felt like such, it was just like, no matter what I did, I felt like a bad mom. I'm, yeah. And, you know, and so, yeah. Ugh. And breastfeeding too, like most honestly, most antidepressants are compatible with breastfeeding. And most doctors won't necessarily let you know that because they don't know. And it's just easier to say like that it's not. So of course, in every individual case, like consult with your care provider, all those things. But in the States, there's um, infant risk, which you can totally like look up um, the specifics about how much antidepressant would be transferred through their breast milk. um, And most of them are at very low levels. And there are a couple that are very, very safe. So for anyone listening who is like, you know, I, I work with moms prenatally who are told by their OBGYN, like as soon as they're pregnant that they have to go off their antidepressants. And it's when we, when, or but maybe by their GP or whatever. And when you look at the data and I mean, like mine offered them to me they're like, oh, you have a history with anxiety. Like, you know, if that comes back, you can just like pop back on the medication you were on. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case for everyone. So like, that's another area where we just like, as a, as a liability issue, a lot of doctors will just say like, nope, it's not safe. I mean, my doctor said that to me and I'm like, I'm literally like, I'm a lactation counselor. Like I can show you the research. Like it's like, there's, there's options here, you know? Um, Anyway, so that I completely understand. And that's a position I, I speak to moms about all the time. And not to mention that it can be scary AF to go to your doctor and say, I think you're wrong. You oh, know, yeah. like, I think you're wrong. Like, I think so. And I, I completely understand. I mean, I've supported moms absolutely who have been in that position. And, um, you know, like as a lactation counselor, I fully consider my role to see my clients like innate wisdom and see them as whole. And so my, like my opportunity is to sit there and reflect with them and help them to see the situation more clearly so that they can choose what they want to do. And like, if they choose to wean because talking to their doctor is, is too, too much for them. Bravo. Amazing. Like, that's awesome. Like you made a, a choice. Cause I fully believe that when you are presented with the information and you make a choice, that you feel supported in, you will not have any regrets. Even if you're presented with new information down the line, because you know for a fact, I did the best I could in that moment. But when it's taken away from us, when that feeling, when we're we're left powerless in those choices, they feel like they happen to us. I mean, that's when we get accused of mommy shaming because we're sharing, you know, just accurate information. And and with very gentle, you know, we're just like, hey, these are the breastfeeding rates. Like, I, I mean, on my own Instagram, like I posted like, oh, here are some cool facts about breastfeeding. Like, you know, breastfeeding is more than just nutrition. It's about emotion regulation and, and, you know, immunological protection and disease prevention. And then I have somebody immediately comment that's like, oh, and formula is like the opposite of all that, right? And I'm like, 
no, not at all. Like we, I could talk about breastfeeding and, and like the things about it. So, and then without being, you know, like trying to come against formula. And I think that that is, um, I think that what empowers women to, to not feel the shame when they're just, you know, being presented with something that they wish they could have done is when they know that they made a, a powerful choice in that mm-hmm. and they did it with the best was like information they had. And I think that like the overwhelming percent of per, uh, the overwhelming uh, majority of women don't get that opportunity to feel yeah. supported and make an informed choice. So they're in a lot of pain still. I feel like it's there's, there's like a similar situation with stimulant meds and ADHD, right? Where oh, it's like totally. anytime somebody talks about the alternatives to stimulant meds or alternatives to meds, you always have to have that caveat. You always have to follow it up with like, I'm not anti-med, I'm not anti-medication uh, because you're so worried that somebody's going to be like, oh, well, you know, how dare you suggest that, you know, we don't take this, um, um, you know, that, that if you're talking about an alternative to medication, that therefore you must be anti-medication. Uh, I'm curious. And speaking to, of, oh, oh yeah, I was going to say, gonna say ADHD meds, there's lots of ADHD meds that are compatible with breastfeeding. Yes. And if in many situations, like formula feeding carries much more risks than breastfeeding with ADHD meds. So talk to your, your care provider. You might have specific situation, like specific um, circumstances that, you know, move that in a certain direction, but just to throw that out there for anyone with ADHD who's thinking about that, there's 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 research um, supporting that you you can breastfeed with ADHD meds. Um, yeah, that was my that was going to be my question because I was like, I feel like there is <laughs> so much more research around stimulant medications than there are around SSRIs, and 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 I think that was you know that was the narrative that I had with both of my doctors, which was like. Uh, is so far it's, it's we think it's safe but there's not really enough research and so if you inadvertently do something to harm your baby you'll have to deal with that for the rest of your life <laughs> like okay never mind right. and <clears throat> excuse me that's another thing right where it's like I used to remember it was the the what to expect when you're expecting books those series oh, used yeah. to drive me crazy because every every <laughs> chapter of that book was like well there is no research to suggest that drinking orange juice is deadly during your pregnancy. There's also no research to suggest it isn't deadly. And I'm like, come on. <laughs> like it was like every, you yeah. know, they were just like, just to be safe, you really shouldn't leave the bubble of your bedroom for nine months. Right. Right. Um, oh my gosh. So true. Right. It's just that, but just that idea of like, you know, you could make that decision, but you might be, you know, destroying your child's life. Right. And we don't talk about the risks of formula feeding, which are present, like, and I'm not trying to bash it by any means, but there's risks for it. So if the alternative is like breastfeeding and they're going to get trace amounts of this medication or formula feeding with, you know, a whole array of risks, like you have to weigh those risks and benefits too. And some medication is not compatible with breastfeeding. So I'm certainly not suggesting that everything is, but we, you know, like look at it in reality too, right? Like, well, and that's what happened with me with, with, I weaned at eight months with my second because I wanted to go back on Selexa and Selexa was not compatible with breastfeeding. And so I was, my choice was, do I try something that is compatible or do I go back to the drug that I know has worked for me in the past? And we, and at at that moment, at that point, I was like, you know, I'd much rather do formula than try to, you know, uh, you know, try a new type of medication that I know. So yeah, it is. You're always kind of just like looking at all the factors and weighing the risk. Full disclosure, people might judge me for this, but I, my four-year-old breastfeeds once a day and my two-year-old is still breastfeeding and I take antidepressants and stimulant medication. So like, that's, you know, just as a choice, like we all have those, those, uh, like those choices, right? Like a lot along the way. And, um, that's a choice that I made for me. And like I said, I've supported so many moms just like you that are in that uh, the situation of like, Hey, like, I don't know, like what, what, what is the best option here? And I always just firmly believe that like every family knows what's best for them when they can tune out all the noise of all the pressure and the expectations and the, the rights and the wrongs and the shoulds and the shouldn'ts. And then it's like, okay, the reality is, is that like, I'm going to feel so much better on this medication. And that's, that's what I need to do right now. Yeah. And it's like, bravo, amazing, you know? So is there anything you think is unique to the experience of a neurodivergent mom or new parent? Like, has there anything that's come up? Cause there, you know, I always have those questions where I'm like, was it 
was it the ADHD? Was it the sleep deprivation? Was it the fact that I worked full time? You know, like there's just so many factors to kind of figure out. Have you come, have you had any interesting insights into like um, navigating new parenthood with neurodivergency? Definitely. Well, on one hand, I think that there's the masking and the shame and all those pieces, which really get amplified when we become parents. So if we've already been living a life that like is, um, you know, like, I feel like we have these things that are very uncomfortable, like these emotions and these feelings. And I was like, okay, like, oh, I'm not good at this or I'm bad at that or whatever. And we kind of organize our life to like not feel that. <laughs> and we can kind of like make um, kind of like, I, I want to say accommodations, but they're not like intentional accommodations where like, I have this and I'm owning this and I'm going to make this choice to do things this way. Instead, it's kind of like, okay, well, I can kind of like, you know, put some duct tape here and I can kind of like do this and kind of do that. And like, I can kind of like, kind of make a life that's kind of working for me. And then we have a baby and like all that flies out the window. And so it's like all our strategies are like, <laughs> like they just fall apart in like a moment. And um, so I think that that is like I think that everyone experiences that to a certain degree but very much neurodivergent neurodivergent parents like very much experience that um on the on the other side as far as like actual elements of neurodivergence that can really like play a role um I think that like rejection sensitivity dysphoria like I think that that can like just like go like massive in those early postpartum days especially when you're going through those hormonal mood swings um it can be very easy to feel so isolated to be reading into like all of the the things um and i think that that's just like a you know a piece that for me understanding that i was like oh okay like mm. so there was a reason that this all felt so intense you know like and it's it's got a name and it's like a thing <laughs> you know and then um I, I yeah i definitely think that like sensory processing um like differences, sensory processing disorder can play a huge role. Um, breastfeeding can absolutely have sensory like things at play. Um, and as much as I say that too, like I, I've supported moms with like mindful breastfeeding. So we, we do mindfulness, te mindfulness techniques while we're breastfeeding to help support the sensory um, issues during that especially if they're pumping too like the pump can be very uncomfortable for anyone and it can be very like difficult the sound of it like auditory it, processing disorder i remember it when you used things, to talk right? to me and it would like sing to me and it would always have these repetitive <laughs> songs where it would be, you know be like uh, i don't remember but it was always to make these noises where i would hear songs in it all the time being like what you doing what you doing what you doing <laughs> love it oh i love it that's so good yeah so that's definitely a piece that i support like neurodivergent um parents and for sure and i i mean like even coming in now especially i had done a lot of like um research into autism adhd all these kinds of things like prior just for my own learning i was just fascinated by developmental psychology and um you know like all of those pieces so um plus my daughter had just tons of things she would just have like epic meltdowns from the time she was super super young um and so i was doing tons of research we were seeing ot's we were doing all those things and then it was like i clicked it was like oh wait that's me <laughs> i have it <laughs> you know so um even before my diagnosis like sometimes i would suggest moms to go and get and get tested for for adhd or even autism it's like i think there's something more going on here and I think that you know that there's supports that can get offered so I am by no means an occupational therapist but I can start to support moms with some sensory things too that can be really um helpful during that um another piece would be like with ADHD um just keeping track of everything so like I really help moms like the scatter brain is so real for pregnancy anyways like mom brain um but to have like a small basket with like the essentials that they just kind of take around the house with them um is so helpful like have your water bottle have some snacks have a diaper have like a receiving blanket have some wipes like ha keep it all right there anything you need 
Um, and also using, I, I don't love tracking apps because I think we can get like kind of obsessed and hyper-focused with them, um, but they can be really helpful during those early days when you're like, which side did I feed on last? And like, you know, and, and maybe your baby's like, like mine, jaundice, super sleepy, not waking up and you need to keep track of the time. And it's so easy to just like be like, when, when did they last feed? I don't know. So um, that's another area that I, I support new parents in for sure. And it is very applicable to neurodivergent parents. Mm-hmm. I think as much as I try to stay away from Facebook nowadays, <laughs> I was so grateful for Facebook communities, you know, uh, and, and yes. groups as a new mom, I felt like it was so important. It, it was so cathartic to find out that other people were having similar experiences. And I think now realizing, like, I think that is also something that's really important when you have ADHD is to sort of find communities and, and be able to kind of break through a lot of that tendency to mask and, sh and isolate because of any sort of shame or guilt issues you might have and to break through that and to get the support of, <clears throat> sorry, to get the support of knowing that you're not alone, like, and, and being able to yeah. feel a little bit more kind of normal in some of these experiences that, and, and so again, like, I just feel like finding your people is so important for people with ADHD in so many different stages of our life. Yeah. Yeah, so as a little plug for that, I have a Facebook group, Moms and Milk Village, and uh, I mean, I bring in experts. Like last month, I had um, like an IBCLC who's also a trauma recovery coach come in, and we talked about lactation trauma and perinatal trauma. And you know, today later on, I'm interviewing like um, a parent coach, and then next month we're doing like a sleep coach. And so, like, there's tons of support out there, and I completely agree. I'm obsessed with like I was obsessed with my mom's groups. And and I found the ones that I loved. Like there was lots that I was like, Meh, too much drama for me. But when I was first a new mom, like, yes, that was my sanctuary. Like going in those groups, I'm not alone. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And like learning from moms who've been there, who can just bring this like peace to that chaos. Like, okay, honey, this is so normal. You got this, you know, it was like, I needed that. And so it's, it's my privilege to be able to support other moms in that same role with that, you know? Well, I love your Instagram account. I love your reels. And, and it's funny because like my kids are 15 and 10. Like I am not your, your demographic at <laughs> all, but it, I find it really like comforting to watch your reels because you do so many like myth debunking. And I think there's just something like, it's been interesting for me to kind of relive that time in my life through watching yeah. some of your uh, social media content because it is like, I mean, some of it is mind blowing, like swaddling. Oh my God, I lived and died by the swaddle. And so that's been, I've been had a really hard time. That's been a hard pill for me to swallow that maybe swaddling <laughs> isn't the best thing. Um, yeah. So, but like, yeah, I just, um, I, I love what you're doing in just like, you know, I think it's that idea of just giving people permission to be like, you know what, that's, that's yes. actually not, you know, these, there's nothing to support this or, you know, like you're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. Like, I just feel like you're very nurturing and, um, no, I and it, it, I feel like my, my inner new mother, uh, <laughs> just really cool. enjoys watching your stuff. I fully believe that everybody on the planet needs breastfeeding education because I believe that there, we don't talk about it. When I was just had, having an interview for lactation trauma, I'm using the hashtag lactation trauma. It doesn't exist. It like literally mm. didn't exist. Breastfeeding trauma had some stuff, but I'm like, why are we not talking about this? As I say, like, this is your first whack at parenting. Like the best time to latch your baby is in that first hour after birth. And it's supposed to be normal and natural, but because of a million reasons that you have no idea about culturally happening, you know, like, I mean, just so many things I could go into. I won't, but all of these forces are kind of against you and your baby mm -hmm. and learning to kind of block that out and like send her back in to just you and your baby. Um, you're just not given that support and those tools to do that. M most of us aren't. And so I really think that it is so healing no matter where you're at. Like, you know, I mean, you can literally talk to women. I've talked to my, my husband's grandmother and she will talk about the trauma of breastfeeding her, her little ones. And, and I've spoke to other women, like, you know, just even my mother-in-law and different people and like share with them, like, it didn't have to be that way. You weren't you, like, you weren't not enough. Like it makes sense. Like a lot of women, you know, their babies are put on schedules super early or they have a tongue and lip tie and it's undiagnosed. And then it's such a common story. Oh, my milk disappeared at six weeks. My milk disappeared. I didn't have any milk. 
But what happens at six weeks is actually that your milk goes from being hormonally driven to supply and demand driven. So if your baby isn't able to remove the milk efficiently, like your supply is going to tank because there's just no demand for it. There's not an appropriate demand for it. And what they feel like is a failure. I don't know what happened. I was, it seemed like it was working and now it's not. And then we have this late onset, you know, low milk supply and they just, they write their stories. Like I called my business on your parenting story. They write their stories and this becomes their narrative. And it really like can really confirm or create these negative core beliefs about who they are as a parent. And then they move through parenthood with those, those things. And the rest of the world says, you had a healthy baby. Everything's fine. There's no shame in formula feeding. And it's like, that's okay. That's fine. Like there's no shame in formula feeding and it's great to have a healthy baby. And that's not enough. Yeah. And how you felt about it mattered. Absolutely. And you deserve to process that, you know? Oh my goodness. Yes. Oh, yes. So, so when do you client, when's the ideal time for a client to reach out to you when they're still pregnant? Um, you know, cause I feel like I, like when you were talking, I was like, God, I wish I just had you on speed dial from the minute I, (laughs) from the minute I gave birth. Cause it's like, you just need that. I think you just need somebody in your corner, you know, and that's, I think a lot of the time as a a new parent, especially as a new mom, I just like, I just felt like everybody else had an idea of what I should be doing. And I never Mm. knew if I was doing the right thing. Like, you know, you just are so, you're just so overwhelmed, um, by that fear. I guess that fear of just like, like you said, like, I'm not enough. And it seems like nobody trusts your wisdom. Like, that's what I feel like is it's nobody trusts me. So how can I trust myself? Mm, It seems like nobody trusts me. Like everybody knows better than me. So how can I trust myself? Right. And I mean, there's a million things I could go into, but to answer your question, that has ADHD written all over it too, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So I love to support moms prenatally. And in fact, I really, really prefer it. I so much prefer to support a mom prenatally than postpartum, not because we can't, I fully believe that it's never too late that like women who many people don't know this, but women who are adopting can induce lactation and they can even induce lactation after menopause. So it's, it's literally never too late. Like if you're experiencing breastfeeding troubles, if you know, like there's, we can create a goal, we can create a plan. We can, we can look at your values. We can look at your lifestyle. We can look at you and your family's unique situation and create a plan to, to meet those goals. Firmly believe that. And it's also hell of a lot of work <laughs> to do that when you I kind of like, like I said, we've, we've come into this moment in time where there's all of these kind of like, you know, elusive factors that are fighting against us and we can't really see them. We don't really know that they're there, but we feel this weight of it. So when we can do that work prenatally and really start to break down some of those beliefs, um, cause my prenatal education isn't just like, here's how you latch your baby. It's like, okay, what are your core beliefs about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> well, how can we like, what are your values, right? Like sleep and, and it's, yeah, it's really, how do you handle triggers when they come up? Like what, what is like, you know, what are your coping strategies? Because all of those things are what you're going to be doing unconsciously once the baby's here and it's just going to reinforce them and it's going to continue to reinforce them in your parenting. And then you're going to reach out to me when your kid is four and they're having meltdowns and you're screaming and yelling and you don't want to be doing that. And absolutely, we all do that. (laughs) Um, But I just mean, you can do a lot of work prenatally to kind of set yourself up for better success down the road. So no shame if you didn't, absolutely not. But I do love to work with women prenatally because I think that we can really do a lot of work there um, during that kind of tender time where there's space versus when, you know, you're literally, it feels like life or death and it's like high stakes um, kind of after birth where there's just extra pressure. So Ideally, it's prenatally. Um, normally, I mean, around 30 weeks is a is a great time to reach out and book an appointment. Um, and then we can set up like one or two prenatal sessions. And I, I have a package too that includes like prenatal education as well as postpartum support and some um, video uh, trainings as well that you can look at um, to, to do some learning. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, do you, <laughs> do you ever work with clients outside of the Windsor area? Like, do you work online with clients? How does that work? Absolutely. Virtually. Yep. Yeah, virtually. I've worked with clients um, all over North America. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it totally, it works great. Um, the only thing I really can't do 
um, virtually is like stick my finger in your baby's mouth <laughs> to do an oral assessment. So that is something that if I suspect that there's something physical going on in the baby's mouth and um, you and I will like me and the client will work together to just see who locally is available to to provide that kind of support. Um, and then I continue to do the coaching like the lactation counseling. So this like very specific knowledge um, of breastfeeding physiologic uh, physiology and, you know, like all of that, as well as the coaching, emotional kind of transformational coaching that kind of fits alongside of that too. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it can all be done virtually. Um, I do a medical history, all that kind of stuff. Um, we normally, I normally have like the laptop going and they might have like a camera. We, we have two different angles to kind of like look at the latch. Um, I have models so I can show you what we need to do. Um, and it works really well. It works really well. Um, that's so cool. I just had a flashback of my lactation coach. She brought a scale with her because <laughs> she would weigh the baby. Yeah. She would weigh my daughter before and after I fed her just to prove to me that I was, that she was getting yeah. enough. Cause I was so, that was like all of my anxiety was wrapped up in like the fact that she wasn't getting enough. And Absolutely. <sighs> You're oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> I love, I love the fact that you, I you, I just find you very appealing <laughs> and I love what you're doing. And I love the <laughs> kind of it's, yeah, like it is, there is so much trauma and I think it's really important to kind of label that as, as what it is and to start that conversation. Yeah. And, you know, rather than be like, Hey, you can do everything new mama, you can do it all. Like you're, you're, um, you know, you can figure out how to balance it and you can go to work and you can do all the things, uh, be like, let's slow down and really talk about like yeah. how, um, yeah, like how much support and help you need. Cause I feel like yeah. that seems and to be a really running matters. theme, right? Yeah. That's what to be really a matters theme. to you. Yeah. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. I think to, to have the space to explore those values and what really matters to you. And you might be surprised, like, you know, you might've thought that work is the thing that matters and then it's parenthood, or you might've thought that I need to be a stay at home mom. And then you're like, actually like, this is what fills me up and what, you know, and then it's like, great. How can we support that? Like, you matter. You deserve to have that, you know? So, Aww. yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Beautiful. So where can people find you? What's your, where your website and yeah. your Instagram and where Own, else are you? Yep. Ownyourparentingstory.com is my website. Um, I have everything there, blog posts. Um, yeah. You can contact me. I have online booking, all that kind of stuff. So it's ownyourparentingstory.com. And then my um, Instagram handle is own.your.parenting.story. And that also works for Facebook as well. Um, and I'm on TikTok too, but I'm not on there as much. And uh, yeah. just say your Facebook group one more time because it was something Oh else. yeah, Moms in Milk Village um, is the, is the uh, Facebook group. And you can find that on, like, on my bio of my Instagram as well, as well as my website too. It's all linked there. Awesome. And what's kind of the age range? Is that any, anyone who is pregnant or breastfeeding or not even breastfeeding? And yeah, so go ahead. Pregnancy to preschool is kind of what I, oh, okay. yeah, cool. pregnancy to preschool. So anywhere from pregnancy to preschool. And, um, I do, I believe that my breastfeeding knowledge will support breastfeeding parents for sure. And also it's the biological norm. So even if you're formula feeding, like your baby's still like a baby and they were like, biologically air quotes, like, you know, quotes designed to like breastfeed. So like a lot of feeding is babies. It's like, okay, well, breastfeeding would meet this need this way. So how can we meet that need, you know, as a formula fed baby? So I, I don't differentiate to say like, I only work with breastfeeding parents. Like I'm super happy to work with then with anyone in that, in that range. Awesome. Um, well, thank you again for sitting down and chatting with me and sharing your story and some of what you do. I was uh, so excited to pick your brain and I, it was very cathartic for me to talk about my own, ex <laughs> my own trauma. Aww. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. Thanks, Jenna. <laughs>